Legends of Wasteland City is a post-apocalyptic anthology series and may contain references to drugs, sex, and violence, along with the occasional vulgarity. You've been warned. Schofield's Drifters, Contingencies, Chapter 5. The modified Royal Enfield ate up the miles, driven by the mechanic contractor often used by the drifters, that they only knew by his call sign, what brakes. He didn't even need to use the homemade turbo booster to keep up with the heavier sidecar rig, which was a good thing because he was never sure exactly how long the Enfield's engine and clutch would survive under boost before disintegrating. When he agreed to accompany Doc Schofield and Digits on their ride back from the gathering of the tribes in Wasteland City, he had expected a straightforward run up to the northern passes, dodging raiders and settlements, but no real problems. Seeing as how he hadn't yet put any armament on the Enfield, if he wasn't going to ride with Icarus and the 30 cal turret mounted on the truck, he figured he might as well travel with the two leaders of the Schofield's Drifters and their heavily armed motorcycle. The fact that the setting sun showed them heading south instead of north was a little strange, but no cause for concern. Helping with the small side job, Doc mentioned, seemed a fair price to pay for the security. The two motorcycles rode with the setting sun on their right until they came to a mass of caves and passes they had stopped at on their way towards the gathering just a little over a week ago. They made a small camp and ate some of the freshest food left over from their time in the city. Uh, I don't want to second guess you guys, but you sure it's safe to camp here? I mean, with the fire? I mean, look, I'm cool saying howdy to a bunch of cannibal scavengers if you are, but, uh... Icarus is usually more chicken. We're good. We have an understanding with the Khan of the Defenestrate Horde. Uh, I've been meaning to ask you about that. How did we go from owing tribute and a bounty on your head to an understanding? The Khan and I agreed that the map would be held in escrow by a neutral party, and we would agree not to interfere with each other's business. This includes limited safe passage through Horde territory. And just who is this neutral party that is so trustworthy? The faceless merchant. Doc raised an eyebrow. Hmm. It was his idea. Hmm. Doc nodded once and returned to his mess kit. He finished his meal and scoured the bowl with sand, then poured some clear liquid out of a flask into his cup and offered it to the other two. Tomorrow, at first light, we head about two hours west. He looked at what breaks. Um, do you know anything about the history of this area? The mechanic shook his head. I've never been this far south, before coming with you guys last year. <laughs> Way before the fall, they built a hydroelectric power plant. Well, actually, two power plants. The dam they built to serve them failed, and over 500 people died in the flooding. One of the power plants was destroyed. What was then the United States government stepped in to rebuild it. They used some new technology that doubled the output of their plant. So, in effect, the new plant was producing as much power as everyone expected both plants to produce. Doc took a long drink. <sighs> Science books being who they are. A group took possession of the old plant and turned it into a government lab. They operated it for 100 years, with no one being the wiser. Made some really amazing energy breakthroughs. That place was way more critical than the Chicago facility ever was. What breaks nodded. <laughs> so that's why you wanted me on this trip. Exactly. I know my way around a lab, and digits can blow up just about anything. But you know more about power plants and generators than anyone else in the Drifters. I don't know what we'll find in there. But I expect we'll need your know-how to get what I'm after. And what exactly is that? Doc smiled. A very special regulator to go with a very unstable power source I may have. Let's get some sleep. We'll go over the plant layout and approach in the morning. At first light, after a cold breakfast and a brief rundown, the trio headed west. The terrain was ideal for a defensive ambush, but Doc and Digis did not appear to be overly concerned. 
After about 30 minutes, they turned due north, crossing a dried riverbed. Off to the right, they could see the ancient ruins of a failed dam. Doc pulled to a stop and pointed to a large structure just visible down another canyon road. That's where we're heading. We'll loop around to the east first to do a survey. It's supposed to be abandoned, but you can never tell out here. Wait here. No sense in advertising our full force if we can avoid it. We should be back in about ten minutes. Got it. I'll hold him off with my trusty sidearm and eagle eye. What breaks pulled a tired-looking snub nose out of an underarm rig. The weapon looked like it was held together with medical tape, rust, and a whole lot of good wishes. Yeah. <sighs> Doc unholstered his 12-gauge coach gun and handed what breaks a fistful of shells. The silver-tipped are armor-piercing, the brass are dum-dums, and the green are scattershot. With that, he gunned the sidecar and took off on a road that led above the structure. Ten minutes later, the sidecar silently coasted down next to the end field. No signs of sentries or outside activities. Right. We'll head down to the main building. Make sure to stay out of the field of the vicars. <laughs> you don't have to tell me twice. The two motorcycles coasted down the road to the old power plant, engines running, but in neutral to minimize noise on this final approach. Doc slowed and looked around. He really wished he hadn't lost his logbook. Was the correct door to the left or to the right? He tried to picture the layout he had drawn many months ago, from the intel gathered even longer ago. With a sureness he didn't feel, he turned right and headed along the edge of the dried waterway, finally stopping at a loading dock with both a roll-up door and a personnel access entry. They turned off the bikes and dismounted. Doc held out his hand. When what breaks didn't react, he pointed to the coach gun and shells. Don't worry, you're getting an upgrade. By then, Digits had finished disconnecting the Vickers machine gun from the sidecar mount. She handed it to what breaks while Doc resecured his sidearm and shells. They made their way up to the small door. Old building, old door, shiny lock. He pulled out a small pouch from his large bag and selected a narrow lock bar and pick. After five minutes work, he shook his head. Uh, this is beyond me. Cracked might be able to open it, but he's not here, so that does us no good. Uh, Digits, you want to give it a try? Digits went back to the sidecar and returned with an armful of gear. In another five minutes, she had small blocks stuck to the door's hinges and lock, wires running from each to a small rectangular box about 20 feet away. She looked over at what breaks and smiled gleefully. This is my favorite part. She pressed two buttons on the box in sequence and an explosion erupted around the door. As the smoke and dust cleared, three small holes were visible around the door. Digits and Doc went up to either side, drew their swords, stuck them in the holes. Using the blades as pry bars, they popped the door out and let it fall to the ground with a crash. For a minute, I was worried about crossbars. I wasn't. I have lots more C4. Doc sheathed his sword and drew his gun. The three entered the supposedly abandoned but well-secured power station. After a quick survey, Doc stopped and stood in the middle of the large building with his eyes closed, concentrating. A minute later, he opened his eyes and directed his attention to what breaks. So, what do you think? Things just don't add up. Mm, explain. Uh, no, no, no. This place is too clean to be abandoned for as long as you said. The power equipment is clean, it's oiled, uh, maintained, but none of it will work. Why not? What breaks gestured? Well... Forget the obvious, that there's no water flowing in the causeway to power the turbines. Maybe it's a seasonal station, but every generator needs an inverter and a regulator, even if all you're doing is charging batteries, which this place is too big for. Doc shrugged. Nah, this is a big place. How do you know the equipment isn't located somewhere else? The engineer shook his head. You gotta put the regulator as close to the power generator as possible. Otherwise, you get surges and ringing in the power cables. You damage the turbine windings in no time. Someone has gone through a lot of trouble to make this pretty non-functioning power plant. Doc nodded. Okay. Now comes the hard part. We need to find the access to the old lab. It could be anywhere, but it is probably fairly large. Why is that? They did a lot of energy and other high-level research. That usually involves big equipment. They're not going to shove that type of gear through a man door. So, 
It may be camouflaged, but we're looking for a big portal. At least roll-up door size. Hmm. Let's start looking. The three fanned out into the main open area. They hadn't advanced more than ten feet when a set of double doors to their left, nearest what breaks, slammed open, and figures started pouring out, quickly spreading to envelop them. Nobody move! Or, or the crazy guy gets it! All the attackers froze as what breaks held the broken down revolver up to his own head. Two loud explosions rang out as Doc emptied his shotgun into the momentarily startled attackers, felling two of them. Those were followed by four quick shots from Digit's python. One more staggered but stayed on his feet. Cursing, Digit's holstered her smoking pistol, drew her blade, and charged into the middle of the enemy. Doc reloaded and started running towards the right flank, firing one buckshot round left-handed towards the center while drawing his own sword before Digits closed off his line of fire. Just as the cultists were realizing that they were now the ones under attack, what breaks dropped his pistol and raised the vickers, spraying the left flank with a fusillade of 303s. Digits barreled into the middle of the attackers in front of her, cutting down and up with powerful short strokes, and then immediately wheeled to the outside, keeping her foes in front of her and preventing multiple attacks. As the closest assailant raised a handgun to shoot at her, she cut down, severing his arm above the wrist. Before he could react, she followed up with a reversed, upwards cut which slashed his throat open. When he started to collapse, she grabbed him and pushed him into two others on her left while ducking and thrusting overhand at an opponent on her right. Less than a minute after it had begun, the building was quiet. The three drifters looked at ten bodies on the concrete floor. Digits wiped her sword on the dark blue cloak of one of the fallen assailants while Doc reloaded his gun from his bandolier. What breaks stood off to the side with a huge grin on his face, holding the vickers like a newfound puppy. Or the crazy guy gets it? What breaks shrugged, continuing to grin. I, it worked against the army of Los Angeles. He's got a point. I got three. Four. Doc sighed, shook his head, reached into his pouch and tossed her an LCC cap. He knelt down to examine one of the bodies. All wearing similar cloaks, all with one of these. He pulled a round medallion with a trident engraved on it from the neck. A bit too uniform to be common raiders. Before you get too into the autopsy, Dr. Death, you might want to look at this. He gestured toward the trail of blood drops across the floor and out the door they had come through. Digis ran through the doorway and came back quickly. Blood stops around the corner. Looks like he made it into a vehicle. Four wheels. Doc stood up. Right. We now have a time limit. We've got to find the regulator and get out of here before he gets back with help. How long do you reckon we have? Uh, if this was the full force, say about a dozen, I wouldn't expect another contingent to be closer than a couple of hours. So, two hours out, two back... We'd better be gone in under four hours. Let's get hunting. What breaks raised his hand? Uh, question from the back of the class? Doc turned. How do you know there aren't more guys somewhere in here? If they were in this building, they would have either joined the attack or run away. If they were in one of the other buildings, they would have attacked us by now. The drifter nodded. Yeah, good enough for me. Digits sided up next to Doc. Or they're waiting for us outside to mow us down when we get back on our bikes. Or they're waiting outside. That's a problem for future Doc and Digits. Right now, we need to find that lab. Thirty minutes later, they had covered almost the entire building with no leads. Doc was contemplating heading out to one of the smaller buildings, but his gut told him the lab would be in the largest structure. Any luck? Nothing. You find anything? Breaks? Well, nothing of interest. Just a false wall with not very well-hidden molding hinge. Doc looked skyward, sighed, and jogged over to where the voice came from. What you got? Digits came running up as what breaks pointed. Well, they did a good job with the counterbalancing of the door. There's no scrape marks on the floor, but uh, they were sloppy with the lubrication. You can see the oil stains over by the molding, and they were trying to make the frame irregular, but the cutout pattern is it's pretty obvious. There's no functioning reason for this trim to look the way it is in the middle of the wall. Doc looked at the wall. If he squinted, he maybe could convince himself he saw some faint discoloration. He shrugged. Okay, 
I saw a pallet jack around the corner. Let's get these crates moved. With the three of them working quickly but carefully, it took the better half of an hour to reposition the crates that were stacked in front of the wall. It looked like no one had touched them in decades. What breaks pulled out a small knife, ran it down a barely perceptible break in the wooden molding and levered it out. With no more than a finger of force, a large section of the wall slowly pivoted toward them. Doc's heart sank. Facing them was a massive steel door recessed into the wall. It looked to be secured with two counter-positioned rams at least ten inches in diameter. I don't think even you have enough C4 to blow that open, Digits. I like a challenge, but you're right. And even if I did, it would probably take down the entire building before it opened that. Uh, that tears it. Let's get this stuff moved back in front of the door and hightail it out of here before the cavalry shows up. What breaks stood still for a moment. Hmm. Half an hour. What? Half an hour. You give me 30 minutes, I'll have this thing open. Contingencies was written by Digits and Doc Schofield of Schofield's Drifters and adapted for audio by Mike Makeshift Darling. Narrated and edited by Makeshift. Doc Schofield was voiced by Jay Preston. Digits was voiced by Megan Hensley. And What Breaks was voiced by Michael Froggy Reed. Legends of Wasteland City is a production of the Apocalypse Post. Stick around after the break for more info about today's episode. Do you want to show off the size of your gun? Do you need a compensator to extend the size of your barrel because your gun is too small? Well, come on down to the Gun Runners, where we have the largest guns in the waste. Everything from RPG Zookas to Mega Flessad rockets. Come check us out inside the Valkyries of the Second Sun camp. It's been a long time since you could just go down to your local drugstore and get yourself a brand new pocket-sized tube of lip-saving chapstick. If your lips have turned into crunchy sandstone like mine used to be, pick up a vial of Eli's Cat Oil Lip Balm. Every batch of Eli's Cat Oil Lip Balm comes from organic, free-range, wild-caught cats. And don't worry, these aren't your little cuddly kittens. They're the kind that would eat you for dinner if given half the chance. Eli's Cat Oil Lip Balm, cause it's all we got. Hey Survivors, thanks for sticking around. This is Makeshift, your narrator and director, producer, creator of Legends of Wasteland City. So today we met another one of the Schofields Drifters by the name of What Breaks. And what a tricky name to work around because it's a question. What Breaks? And uh, I don't know the origin of that name, but I imagine it has to do with the fact that he's a mechanic and likes to drive really fast. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was voiced by my good friend from L.A., Michael Reed. He did the uh, Feral Raider an episode back, but now he's doing his uh, his lead character, What Breaks. And he's a very talented actor and voice actor who's been in so many great independent films. I couldn't even get started to list them off. But his latest project is actually a horror movie that he co-stars in with his real-life partner, Augie Duke, who's another huge indie film actress. And that movie is called 645, as in 645 p.m., so 6 colon 45. And it's actually set to be released this month on streaming. I don't know where yet. Uh, let's see, we got DVD and Blu-ray premiere. So it's out there. Uh, look it up. It, it looks like a lot of fun. I actually haven't seen it yet, but um, the trailer's pretty damn badass. And by the way, all three of today's voice actors, that's Jay, Megan, and Michael Reed, they all had parts in the Wasteland 3 video game. So if you have been playing that as a post-apocalypse video game fan out there, uh, you'll hear their voices throughout. I don't know how big their roles are, um, but uh, but yeah, it's pretty cool. And I love having friends that are just doing really cool things. And I'm also not sure if I've mentioned it before, but the voices of Doc and Digits, that's Jay and Megan again, they were also both in the brand new post-apocalyptic video game called Horizon Forbidden West. And that was just released like last month or something like that. So that's pretty cool. Okay, story-wise, the three drifters have broken their way into a supposedly abandoned power station, only to find themselves rushed by a strange ocean cult tribe of some sort. We don't really know what their 
uh, into. We don't really know anything about them. So uh, if we do continue to push forward with the Schofields Drifters storyline, maybe we'll get a little bit of backstory on them, which would be pretty cool because I love these like just kind of random tribes, uh, random stories. It's it's just so fun what you can do when you're talking post-apocalypse. You can just kind of, you can base a tribe on anything, right? Uh, Fallout did it so well. And of course the Mad Max series does it. Um, when you look at like the War Boys and they have this whole thing uh, about covering their skin with different dusts, probably because they're in the desert and they need some some kind of sunblock, uh, especially since they all got cancer anyway, which is kind of crazy. But anyway, you can take any one of these small ideas and kind of expound on it and just see what, what kind of creativity uh, just sparks itself, which is really, really fun. So what breaks pulls a move? That kind of reminds me of barking like a dog in basketball. You guys, I'm sure you've seen these. Uh, they go back all the way to like uh, America's Funniest Home Videos, right? Where you get the kid that suddenly jumps on all fours and at the end of the basketball game distracts the other team just long enough for them to get the upper hand and take that three-point shot to win it last second. Uh, he kind of did that the same thing, except this time he holds a gun to his head and basically just confuses the hell out of the tribe. And it worked! And I guess it was for the second time because he mentions using that same tactic on the Army of Los Angeles before. Which, by the way, the Army of Los Angeles is another Wasteland Weekend tribe who happens to reenact the game of Jugger, based on the 1980s movie Blood of Heroes. And I've done a couple of documentaries on them, uh, one very short and one a little bit longer, which you can find on the Apocalypse Post YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash the Apocalypse Post. The one I think you should watch is called You Will Get Hurt, <laughs> petitioning the Juggers of the Wasteland or something like that. Check it out. It's kind of fun. And it follows a, a wonderful guy that um, decided that it was his time to, you know, shoot for glory and, and join a Jugger League. It's just really fun. If you've never seen Blood of Heroes, by the way, definitely give it a watch. It's um, one of those, like, really early derivative movies that's totally based on Mad Max. But it also kind of fits in the same world. Like, it could be in the same world. I could definitely see Mad Max just showing up to a Jugger game at some point, which would totally make sense because he kind of does that. I mean, he doesn't do that, but, but you know, it's not that far off of when he goes to um, Barter Town and ends up, you know, having to play uh, the death battle in the Thunderdome. It's not really a game, but it kind of is. I mean, all post-apocalypse games tend to be a little bit less concerned with safety. <laughs> <laughs> just look at like death race uh pretty cool stuff so anyway the uh, drifters yeah they were able to dominate the cultists in this one and this time they shot first and asked questions later which was a stark difference from digit's tactic in the past couple episodes where she did everything she could to not fire weapons because they were a little outgunned but but thanks to what breaks on this one they got the jump on these cultists and after they have the place to themselves they fan out to find the regulator and i love how each of these characters, they've got their own set of skills and weaknesses, right? So it kind of reminds me of when you're playing like uh, role-playing games where you have to build a, a, a team and they have to work together to reach their goals, but all but they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, you know, you, you've got your tank and you've got your 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 healer and you've got your like spy. Uh, anyway, it, it kind of starts to feel like that with these drifters where they each definitely have their skill set and they would not be able to do things without each other. Uh, I just really appreciate that. And as far as the story goes, if you're going to have multiple people, you better have a reason for it. So uh, the fact that Doc and Digits didn't do this alone just makes it so that, you know, why did we bring what breaks? What What is he bringing to the team? And uh, so far, <laughs> he brings a little bit of comedy and uh, some really good questions. But don't worry, in, in the next episode, you're going to see exactly what kind of skills this mechanic is bringing uh, in order to help them out. In the next episode, we're going to wrap up this story. That's going to be the last episode of Contingencies. Uh, we're going to find out if the Drifters can break into the old lab, find the regulator, and get out of the power plant before the escaping cultist returns with backup. Will they make it out in time? Uh, I guess you'll have to tune in next week to find out. Uh, but after that, we are going to continue and actually turn this into an anthology because it's always meant to be. The Legends of Wasteland City is always meant to be an anthology, telling stories from lots of different tribes around the wasteland, uh, and how they all intersect the ground zero of this, of this whole story world is Wasteland City, and how all these tribes just 
intersect and, and interact together. And actually, just this past week, I got to record the voiceover for our next story, which is going to be titled Asylum or Asylum. And that comes from Rabbit Asylum. It's kind of a origin story for them. And it was my good friend Lauren Harding that uh, offered to read the part of Cage. Uh, you'll meet her in the next episode. No, not in the next episode, in the next story. It's kind of interesting how it all worked out because she is mostly a musician, a singer these days. Uh, singer, songwriter, she's in that group, Crimson Calamity. I've mentioned them before. They're really great if you get a chance to check them out. Plus, you can see some of my video, some of my music video work because I've done all of their music videos and they're all totally different and lots of fun. Um, some really sad, some kind of funny. Um, some more like a rock and roll vibe. Anyway, uh, check them out. I mean, they're not post-apocalyptic, but definitely worth a listen. I think you guys will appreciate them. She mentioned she was going to be doing some voice acting for another project, and she was kind of excited about it. And I said, well, hello. Um, would you be interested in, in doing some voice acting for my project? And what is kind of cool is Lauren was in high school when I was in college. And this is back in New England. I was going to Bridgewater State. I was taking fine arts, spending a whole lot of time in the theater. And anyway, her high school class came to see my college play, which is pretty cool. So we had met before we had met. Well, I guess she knew she had seen me act long, like years before we met in Los Angeles, which what a, what a great coincidence, right? And so now uh, she did some voice acting and she's absolutely crushing it because this next story asylum or asylum is actually it's not narrated because it's um first person so she does the whole thing she's got the whole story it's going to be a single episode uh and i think it's a lot of fun and it, it is it's a it's a origin story for rabbit asylum which is one of my favorite new tribes at wasteland weekend i don't know if this was their first second or third year um, but they were such a pleasure to go hang out with if you've been watching the youtube channel or listening to the podcast i've, I've mentioned them before uh, they were like this rock and roll tribe uh, with live bands and a, and a small stage but they also they kind of played up the whole like asylum thing like the escaped uh crazies almost and so, yeah, we're going to get an origin story from them, which I'm super excited to to do. And I think they're going to have some more stories along the way. I don't think they have any yet. So this might just be a single, but we'll figure it out as we go. Uh, and in some real world news, we've had more survivors sign up to support on Patreon. We're now at 44 of 50 to meet our goal that we're trying to reach before the end of contingency. So you've got this episode and next episode. We've got one week left to gain six more patrons. If you're enjoying the show and want to help support the creation of more episodes, you can join up for as little as a dollar an episode. It doesn't take much and even a little bit adds up, especially with the more and more people that are joining. Plus, don't forget that anyone that joins the Patreon during contingencies are going to receive a free makeshift patch and a handwritten postcard from me makeshift in the mail uh, once you've either stuck around for a month or or donated five dollars whichever one hits first i'll just i'm gonna put it in the mail send it on out and plus as a patron you get 15 percent off everything in the apocalypse outpost merch store which i don't think i've mentioned that enough but i just reposted it on patreon so if you guys are a patron there's a code on patreon in the feed uh, and I'll kind of repost that every now and then just so you get a reminder, you know, just just as ongoing appreciation of your continued support. And, uh, you know, I've, I've I see the numbers, guys. Some of you have been supporting for a long time. And, um, you know, it's it's no small amount that uh, a lot of you have donated. So I really, really appreciate that. It helps to keep things going and uh, make sure that I can carve out the time to keep producing more and more episodes because it does take a lot of time. And it, but it's it's so fun. Basically, you guys are helping me to follow my dream of producing more post-apocalypse content. And I got to tell you, I got my start in, you know, the uh, in Hollywood world as an actor, as an artist, as a musician. Um, when I got to Hollywood, uh, I spent 10 years there and I was an actor at first. And then I got into web series. And I mentioned before, Alpha Planet was my first web series. And I, I wrote it with um, with my partner at the time. It was such a blast and I loved telling original stories and I, and just somewhere along the way I got away from it, you know, probably just to help pay bills. Uh, and so I got to doing more commercials, more corporate stuff, uh, a lot more of the boring side of filmmaking where I'm more videographer than cinematographer. But here we are telling stories 
narrative stories, once again, that I'm very interested in and I would love to listen to. Like, I love to produce the stuff that I want to tune into, you know? Which is why I'm taking this extra effort to throw in all the sound effects and the music and to to kind of like find the pace and find the mood and and not just read them to you. Because that's definitely something I could do. And again, I might do it on some future episodes if uh, if it calls for it. But for now, I absolutely love really rounding these out and kind of creating more of a radio play. Or uh, I like to think of it as a full movie without the pictures, if that makes sense. Like, because it's more it's more than just an audiobook. And, but it's not quite like the radio play of yesteryear because it is still narrated. I don't know. I hope you guys like the balance that we're doing. Anyway, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, don't forget, Contingencies Episode 6, the one that comes out next, is going to be the last episode. So it's time to get caught up. And for you guys that are just, for you guys that waited a little while so you could binge it, you know, we're, we're almost there. So I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for listening. Wherever you're listening, if you can, leave a thumbs up or a rating, please do that. And don't ever forget that if you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your friends. And if you hated it, share it with your enemies, along with a severed hand belonging to a trident-worshipping cultist. I'll see you next time, survivors. Stay alive. Days and days and days and days and days.